Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God, praise God. Can we just have everyone not moving for a few minutes just to give God glory? Can we quiet down in the back a little bit, please? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Most high God, the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords, and we come based on your grace, your love, and your protection in all that's happening on this planet right now. We know you love us. We know you're in charge. Your power cannot diminish no matter what is happening, my God. You are faithful and we are your people. You say you inhabit the praises of your people. You said where the twos and the threes are gathered, there you are in the midst. Mighty God, you said if we humble ourselves and come boldly before you and pray, you will hear from heaven. That's what you said. You said you will hold us up with your righteous right hand. Mighty God, we come knowing who we are. We know who you are and that your power cannot fail. Mighty God, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that is due to you just because you're God. We magnify your name. We lift you on high. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your power. Pour out your spirit on your people, we ask, mighty God. On the service today, on the man of God that will minister your word, let it go boldly, unhindered, mighty God. We give you praise. We thank you. We have not forgotten how big you are. And no COVID and no sickness and no disease is going to minimize that. We give you praise. We are the people of the Most High God. And we are the redeemed. And we say so. We take authority. We take, mighty God, more ground. We, mighty God, we speak to the enemy and we call it null and void. You said, Father God, that what, Lord Jesus, as we seek you, we will find you. That you will open doors. No one, no one can close. We give you praise, Heavenly Father. That's how big you are. You're still the God that, mighty God, you open doors where there's, it's not even possible any other way. We thank you, Father God, for your healing, your power, your protection. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for those that can't pray for themselves, that don't know you yet, the lost, the broken, the ones under the bridge, the ones that are hurting, the ones that are in lack and poverty. We call them into the body. We thank you, Jesus. You are a big God, a great God, a loving God, and we will not forget that. In the mighty name of Jesus, let everything that is done and said here be for your glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And you're still an awesome God. You're still setting captives free. We thank you, Lord God, for your, you're such a great God in this house. Somebody say, awesome God. Awesome God. Say it again. Say, awesome God. Awesome God. Have your way, service in this service today, Lord God. You are awesome.
Victory. 
let the sun is set free. Got quite He let the sun is set free. It's free indeed. Yeah, I know it is. He let the sun is set free. It's free indeed. Ooh, let's do that part again. Say. Break it down, break it down, break it down, break it down. You see, walking all around the earth. Some people don't even know the victory that they got from Jesus Christ. But we know in, that God said that he's ordered the steps of a righteous man, of a righteous woman. Are you righteous? Let me hear you say, yeah. So we're going to do this part one more time. And if you got the victory in Jesus, I want to see you wave your hands in the air like you just don't care. And say, I got it, and I got it right now. Say
standing at the altar, surrendering all. Lord, I hear you call my name. I will never be the same. Standing at the altar,
open up my eyes. Papa, I want to love like you. Like you love me. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Before I do anything, that last song, uh, I wonder if you could put the words up to at the very start of that last song we just we, we just sang. Uh, I started singing that, and something inside of me shook. It was it was like a call for me to retune my entire being into him. I see I see the king of glory coming on the clouds with fire. And then the next line, and the whole earth shakes. You know, as I, 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 as I was reading that, as we were singing it, sometimes we sing and we don't pay attention to the words. But understand what that was telling us. That when our Savior comes back, he's coming back in authority and power. And the whole earth is going to know. And the next part says, I see his love and mercy washing over all our sins. The people sing, the people sing. Could you put up the next? I see a generation rising up to take their place. Do you hear that? I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith and selfless faith. I see a near revival. Listen, okay, that's fine. Thank you. I read I, as we were singing that song, man, it just got through me and it, 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 it kind of tuned me in to where we are today and what's happening today. And it made me think this. I say, God, what do you have of me now no uh, now not what do you have for me what do you have of me what do you have of me now here's the thing are you available are you available what do you have of me I'm ready I'm ready to take my place well this being black history month it was something that was laid on my heart for a little while and I want to share this and before we do, I'm going to get you to raise your hands and let's stretch up to heaven and thank God. Father and God, we thank you. Father, I pray today that this message touches somebody's heart and lets us all know and understand, oh God, that you have a purpose, you have a plan, and that you have included us all. So, Father, I thank you today for your word. Father, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would come and uh, come in the midst of us and meld in the midst of us. Open our, our, our spiritual ears and eyes of understanding that we may receive from the teaching of the word of God to bring us revelation and knowledge today. Father, we thank you for authority and power in the name of Jesus as we go forward to increase kingdom territory, declaring the year and the day of our Lord. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, one of the first things I'm going to get you to do as I get myself kind of somewhat organized here is I'm going to get you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read down from verses 17 uh, down to the end. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hallelujah. Now, one of the things I'm going to be preaching about today or teaching about or sharing with you today is is this. And before we read the scripture, I, I want to share this with you. When I was young and I was growing up and, I'm, and going through school, I remember not seeing much of a reflection of myself in any of the history books. In other words, I would hear about European culture I would hear about other cultures and history, but I didn't see anything of me. I remember when I was a young boy and I was at school and the teachers asked us, the teacher asked us to draw a picture of what you want it to be. So I drew a picture of what I want it to be and what I saw myself as being. And I can't remember if it was a police officer or something like that. And I had long blonde hair and uh, blue eyes. But that was because there was no other images available of anything that looked like me. You know, we, we, we laugh at that, and it is, you know, but th there's a severity to that. And that severity is that when you're not seen in, in articles and books and things of history that represent you, you could start to think that you really don't matter or you, you, you put no value on who you really are. Yep. I saw myself the way I saw society and the media. And at that time, we didn't have as many cable channels as we have now. So whenever you did turn your TV on, you always saw other people on TV. I watched hockey. There weren't many black people playing hockey. <laughs> there weren't many black people playing hockey. There was a black puck on white ice, getting hit very violently by sticks. <laughs> but that, that, that was just kind of thrown in there. But my point is that we didn't see much of us in society and history of what we, uh, representing us. Um, I remember, for example, being in history class in, in grade, grade 12 and reading about uh, uh, First Nations, but they didn't call them First Nations at that time. And in some books, they were referred to as savages. This is the representation that was presented. And I remember at, at that same year sitting and, and doing history, but not hearing anything about where did I come from? Who am I? How did I get here? What about my story? And there are stories. Oh, there are stories. The thing is that they never really presented them to us. I went through all my school, never... Uh, never hearing about what happened to Africville. The only way I would find out is if somebody ever talked about it. Didn't know where Africville was. See, this is a part of our history that was never revealed to us. And then wh what's revealed, you never hear the whole story. Now, here's the interesting thing, and this is where I'm going to go today. The interesting thing is, how many of you read the Bible? I'm going to just be honest. When I read through the Bible, and especially when I was a younger man, I never saw in the Bible a reflection of me. Whenever I'd go anywhere and I'd go to visit different churches and different places, I would see pictures on their stained windows and glasses of the Last Supper, crucifixion, white hair, blonde, blue eyes, but no representation of me. And I don't want this to be harsh on anybody. But there's a reality that has been held back that we need to understand and know. And what this reality is that, and th this is how it's been used powerfully to hold us down as a people. Did you know that if you see no representation of you in any type of article or media that shows you as being good or shows you as even being inclusive, you could start to think as a people that you have no value. And because we don't see that sometimes, we don't treat each other with value. Because that's not what we've seen.
But what I'm going to show you today, blackness in the Bible. But not to the point that it puts other people down, but to the point that it shows inclusivity. And my main point in this is showing that God has had a plan. And we've been included in his plan from day one. As a matter of fact, even more so than some people would want you to know. Even more so. So I want to start because even in, in the teaching today, I want you to understand and know that even though we're going to talk about blackness in the Bible, here's the big thing is for all of us to know that this is important, but it is more important for us to move in the spirit. It's more important for us to move in spirit. It's good to know these things, but understand and know that we've got to connect with God spiritually. There's been a great injustice done, I believe, in history where people have presented biblical stories and they've not included us. How many of you remember being young and watching watching movies in, uh, of uh you know, around Christmas time and Easter time, and, and you see people portraying people of Egyptian culture, but they don't really look Egyptian. You see, that's been an injustice because we y- you want to tell the truth, tell the truth, Sh- show the truth, let 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 us see the reality. So I want to read this passage of scripture and then want to get into a few things and I promise it won't keep you long today, but I hope this blesses you. Starting at verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you are in Christ and this is our this is our banner for this year, I want you guys to understand and know that this is our banner. It wasn't just for a particular service or the first service of the year. This is our banner, life in Christ and holiness and the fruit thereof. So now this first passage of scripture says, therefore, if any man, what? Be in Christ. Life in Christ. So the moment you were in Christ, you are a new create, new creature, new creation. The old man has passed away. Is that what your Bible says? Yeah. Are we reading the same thing? Yeah. Old things are passed away. That means that old nature I- is passed away. I'm not that person anymore. So the fruit of my life, my life, my living should reflect my being in Christ. And he goes on and it says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Us, everybody. Everybody's included. Everybody's got a, a, a role to play in the ministry of reconciliation. It is not just the pastor, okay? It's not just the leaders, and it doesn't only happen on Sunday when you come to church. As a matter of fact, the bulk of the work is done before you come to church. This is where you should come and get fueled up so you can go out into the ministry and the mission field and be a part of reconciliation. Verse 19, to say, that God is in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, I want you to get this. Now then, we are ambassadors. Are you in Christ? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Have you? So uh, guess what? No matter what picture or image the world may paint of you or may want you to think of you, 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 we've got to get this picture that God has painted of us, what he's painted of me, what he's painted of you. And this passage says that now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be Ye reconcile to God. And look at this. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be, what? The righteousness of God in him. If you are in Christ right now, you need to talk to yourself and say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. See, now, when you do that, you know, you're talking to yourself. In other words, they're tuning you up. 
all those other thoughts you may have of yourself, all those negative thoughts that sometimes we get of ourselves, when we, when we release that word, see, we're tuning us up. And I'm saying, though I felt this way, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ because I'm in him. And that's their number one identity is in Christ. Do you believe that? That every believer, that's your identity. Your number one identity is in Christ. Yes, it's important for us to know who we are and to know where we come from, but it's more important that we know whose we are. So, uh, Galatians 5, 25. I want to start in verse 24. Okay, if you go to verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with afflictions, with afflictions and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. You know what that means? That, that means let's put more attention on our spiritual walk. It is important for me to know you, but my focus can't always be on the color of your skin or the color of my skin. I've got to look for something deeper. I've got to look and see the, the God character in each one of us. And for us, during this time, African Heritage Month, it's good for us to understand and to know where we come from. Let me tell you why this is important, because if we don't do this, no one else is going to. If we don't hear, if we don't know who who we are and that we had a part in this, no one else is going to tell us. And for a long time, no one has. Do you, under, do you know that that was one of the reasons why they didn't want people enslaved to read? Because if they learned to read, they could read the truth and find out that they were here from the beginning. As a matter of fact, this started with us. Right? But so if you hold that back from people, and the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So you see, if, they, if someone could take the Bible and write me out of it, I would have no knowledge of that I'm included in it. And then you could make it look like I'm not worthy and that you're better than me. But the truth of the matter is that we all come from the same dirt of the ground. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, the dirt of the ground in Eden is found in Africa. So if we really want to go back in the history, we could come and find out that you all were made from the ground of African soil. But they don't want everybody to hear that, do they? But we need to know the truth. And what my point here is, is that God, we were never a second thought to God. We were never a second thought. We were right there in his whole plan of things. We were right there. But you know, when in, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, when people were translating the Bible, they did a good job of writing us out of it. Writing us out of it. Do you understand that the, the truth of our involvement in the Bible was kept out? That may be hard to hear, but yes. But when you look into it, you can find and you'll see that we're right there. We're right there. Right from the beginning, we're right there. Do you, I don't know if you understand what value that puts on you. What value that puts on you. And you know what else it does? It levels the playing field. It really levels the playing field. You know what that means? That means I have every opportunity. I have access to everything God has ever made available. Those same doors are there for me. <laughs> Lies tried to keep them shut and to hold us back from it. But not anymore. So I believe that from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, you will see lots of proof of black people in the Bible. Want to know one of the reasons why we don't see it? Because sometimes we don't read enough. Sometimes we don't read enough and we stop digging. We take everything somebody else tells us. You know, when I was young, 
and I, uh, I, I, I would read the Bible. I would go Genesis, and I'd go on, you know, Exodus. Keep going through the Old Testament, and I'd, I'd get up and start and get into Chronicles, the begats. He begat, he begat, and then they begat, and he begat, and then in Numbers. But there's something in that if you take the time, because this is generational. And what it would show if you take the time and trace it back and you look at these people and find out where they come from. See, we never took time to find out and follow Noah's children and see where they come from, where they go, and who they represent. And then you'll see the generations that come after and the generations that come after. And if you even start with Jesus and go backwards, you will see certain names in the Bible. And if you trace those names, you'll find out where they come from. And when you find out where they come from, you will, rep you will recognize their nationality and their race. And then you get to see it. I truly believe it. I believe Adam, uh, the Bible describes him as dusty, as uh, uh, ruddy, red hair. So if you think about it, my brother pastor said one time to me, he said, man was nothing but dirt until God formed him from the ground. Anybody think about that? He said that a long time ago. But you know, that still messes in my head because I started asking this question. Mm, what color was the soil? Because if he made him from the ground, then he would reflect the color of that ground. So I just asked myself the question, well, what color was the soil in Eden? Well, Eden was a garden, and gardens need rich soil to grow. And everything that grew in Eden was perfect. So the soil had to contain everything that was necessary. It also had to be necessary to ca carry water to it. So I was wondering, what, what, what color was the soil? So, obviously, anybody here plant? So, if you plant, the darker the soil, usually, the, the mm, I'm, just, I'm just throwing this out here, then Eden was a garden. <laughs> Eden was a garden. And everything grew. And grew well. So if it was a garden and the soil, then to maintain that, had to be richer in color. Some shade of color, correct? So then when God created man and he went and he picked up the dirt, here's a good example. How many of you have ever made a snowball? When you bend down to scoop up that snow to make the snowball, what color is the snowball? So if God scoops down to make something out of the ground, wouldn't it reflect the color of the soil that it is made out of? So then, with that point, I don't know the degree of the color of the soil, but we do know that soil had some color, which would mean then Adam had some color. Again, the color isn't the thing that's important. Because he became, he was nothing still, just a shell, until God breathed his spirit into him. But the point I'm making is, for so long, blackness has been kept out of the Bible. So that we wouldn't recognize and see that we had a part in the Bible. Even so, to the very beginning. Wow. The Garden of Eden is described... In Genesis, it has four rivers, four river systems in the region, in the lands of Cush, Halva, Asher, today, which would be near the borders of eastern Sudan, Ethiopia. See, the thing is, we read these words, but we <laughs> never follow them. Sometimes you got to stop and look it up on the map. And did you know that the, the, the continents weren't all separated? at one time. So really when you go and you look at older maps, older maps, you'll see that Africa was really connected to 
even what's the Middle East today, there was no separation. <laughs> but again, if we stop reading, we won't get this information. How many of you agree that knowledge is power? I can't remember the writer who said this. I wasn't sure if it was Frederick Douglass or Booker T. Washington, and they said, they said, uh, no, that wasn't that one. But there was someone who wrote this, and it said that if you give a Negro an inch, they'll take a mile. I read that when I was in university, and I was having a hard time, but I read that. And then when I read it, I got it this way. So if you give a Negro education, and education is the inch, he will assimilate into society, and that will be your mile. This is why education had to be held back. Because if you never know that you were never intended to be a slave, you would never be a slave. But when all you hear is that you are a slave, that's all you become conditioned to. And we become conditioned to what we hear and what we see and what society paints of us. So this is powerful for young men. I have a young man sitting right here, two young men over here, another young man here. And for all of our young people, the young, young ladies in the house too. But this is so important. I'm going to speak specifically for a moment about young black males. Because if we grow up in an environment that does not give us positive information about ourselves, then we start to liken to the negative information that society paints about us. Not every young black man or young black boy is going to grow up to be a thug. But you see, but in society and in a lot of writings, we don't see enough portrayals of young black men as doctors or as lawyers, you know, or police officers. So you see, it's important because what happens is we start to act the way society sees us. But that's not what my history is. My history isn't that I came along later. My history is that we were there in the beginning. So if that's the case, then that means that another race isn't su more superior than me. Because we were there at the beginning, and we were there too. You, you, you understand why this is important? And how many of you also agree that the Bible is one of the most powerful books ever, ever, ever published in the world? Amen. So if that be true then, and many people around the world read it, but we see no reflection of us in it, then it could give us a mindset that there was no purpose or no real plan for us. So then we really don't have any value. But that's not the point. Because the point is that we aren't only in it, we were in it from the very beginning. Did you know that some of the oldest remains, I'm just giving you some information from some articles that I've been reading. Did you know that some of the oldest remains were found in Africa? Now, I'm going to get you to turn over to the book of Genesis in just a second, and we're going to show you a few things. But I want you to also know this, that many of the Hebrews had married into African tribes. But sometimes, because we don't understand the names, we don't look any farther. But we do remember the names of Abraham, right? Abraham married Hagar. Or she, she was his uh, concubine. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16, verses 1 to 16. And for, for the for people of African descent, we're all in this book. We are all in this book. We're all in this book. And having that knowledge does something. And it, it brings 
there's something that happens inside of you when you realize that you were a part of the plan from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the, the, face of the, of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters, divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so good. So how many of you seeing so far will follow the law? We're talking about creation. We're talking about the beginning. Verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven and and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together under one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God so called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw it was good. So here's the question. If God could create the seas, he could create the land and calls it good. Then everything that God creates is good. So really, we got to understand and know that the purpose of God when he created man, he created man being the blueprint for humanity and mankind, God's intent was good. So whether you be black, whether you be white, whether you have red skin or, or yellowish skin, guess what? God's purpose for you was good. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw it was good. You see a blueprint here? See a blueprint here? That the seed of who you are is, all is in you. So when you marry and you have family, the seed of who you are continues to go on. Because God put this blueprint in place for every living thing. So when you, when you marry, if you marry someone outside of your race, your race is not neglected and it is not forgotten, even if it goes generations and generations, because that seed of that generation is still in there. And this is what happens in the Bible. So the moment someone marries someone of African descent, that African descent is never left out of the Bible. It continues on and on and on. And it actually, you will see, it is found in the bloodline of Jesus. And th so these are this is information. Wow, in the bloodline of Jesus. Wow, I'm, I'm going to get there in a bit. Verse 15. And let them be the light and the firmament of the heaven and to give light upon the earth. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night. And he made the stars also. So God is the God of creation. Where did I tell you to go? Okay, good. Now, stay there. Stay in 16. I was in the first Genesis. And I wanted to show you the blueprint for the beginning. Let me ask you something. If you, if you knew that the, the seed for you was there at the very beginning, how would that make you feel? If you knew that God's thoughts about you were there at the very beginning, how would that make you feel? So think about it. All throughout history up to this point, for people of African descent, in North America, the images that people have painted of us has not done us fear, right? But now if you could see and read and see that God had a purpose and a plan and that we were a part of all of this from the very beginning. It changes something in me. It makes me realize, and this is the power. The power is for a young person for these young kids that are here today, this lets them realize, I have worth right now. 
lot of times we, we, we see that someone has value or worth when they become successful and make a lot of money. I remember one time I saw somebody driving, driving by and they were driving a real nice car. And the person with me, the first thing the person said, what, they, what do they do? That's the first thing we want to ask. What do they do? Right? So when I think about us now and I think about a young person, we can look and see that the seed for success is right here. It's in you and it's been there from the very beginning. Uh, just before I continue reading, I want you to do this. Take your, take your finger, put your finger on yourself. I want you to say this and I want you to say, I've got good in me. God put it there from the very beginning. All right. So now you got the blueprint. God started it from the beginning. Now let's get over here and look at the life of Abraham. Uh, Genesis chapter one. I'm going to probably skip through a little bit here. I'm sorry. Chapter 16. Now, Sarah, Abr Abram's Sarai, a Abram's wife, bear him no children. And she had a handmaid, a handmaiden, an Egyptian, an Egyptian, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar, an Egyptian. Where's Egypt located? Uh, Egypt is located where? Okay, so if that be the case, then here comes here comes this handmaiden maiden who's coming in, who is an Egyptian. And verse 2, and, and Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my hand, uh, go into my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. So, so here's the other thing. I want to, uh, I believe that God is generational. Do you know that Abraham never disowned his children? He never disowned his children. Ishmael, when it was time and they were sent away, he never disowned them. He sent them away, and he sent them away with stuff. But the important point I want you to get here is that here you st I'm starting to see. Um, this is Genesis 16, and I'm seeing African heritage being involved here. Does anybody else see that? So I ask you again really quickly, where's Egypt? Uh-huh. Okay, verse 3. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dw dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Well, I'll come back to that, too. And gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And when he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Mm -hmm. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was, I was despised in her eyes. And the Lord judge between me and thee. Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And Sarai dealt hardly with her, and she fled from her face. Now I want to skip down. Get down to verse 14. And she called the name of the Lord and spake unto her, Thou God seest me, for she, for she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore, the well was called, oh, that's a good word, <laughs> Behario. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bri, and Hagar, Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ismael. And Abraham was fourscore and sixty years old, when Hagar bare Ismael to Abraham. Now, again, the question I want to point out here is where was Egypt? In Africa, right? Okay, so if that's the case, what we're seeing here is we're seeing Africa being involved. We're seeing Africa and African descent 
being involved. I don't know about for you, but for me, that was important. Abram also had, Abraham also had a child with a lady named Kentra. Ketra, K-T-U-R-A-H, Genesis chapter 25. Just stay with me for a bit. All right, starting in verse 1. Then Abraham took a wife. Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bare him Zim. Now watch, Zim and Joshan, and Medan, and Midian, and I- Ishbak, and Sanu. And these, th- these, th- these people and these names, because he took this lady, uh, and again, and she is from African descent. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. So, in the beginning then of the Garden of Eden was in uh, Africa. I believe then, from that moment on, our history has always been involved in God's plan. And that's what's going to be important to recognize is that God has a plan for you. You know what that means then? For, For someone like me of African descent, what that means to me is that I'm not junk. Uh, I'm not junk. And no matter what the society may say about me, God had a plan. So much so that he included us in his plan. And I believe it's important. God has always had a bl- plan for black people. And guess what? It, guess what? People will even use the Bible to hold you down. That's, that's a part of how it was played out. Many people throughout history and throughout church history, and that there are there are there are church organizations, especially in the South, that would use religion to hold black people down. And today, some of those organizations organizations are big, big organizations. And if you really think about it, you know, and, uh, and I don't have to tell you this. You could just watch 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 old movies and see. You go down south and you see uh, uh, plantations. And, you know, plantation owners went to church. Plantation owners went to church. (laughs) Some of those owners were even preachers. And then out of some of those plantations and some of those churches became big churches and big organizations. Built off the back of slavery. That's a tough one to hear, but that's what happened. But now. Could you go over to Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, please? Acts 17 and verse 26. I mean, I just showed you a couple of examples, but guess what, everybody? There's more. I'm just skimming through my notes. There are so many examples of blackness in the Bible. And sometimes someone may say, well, how come I never saw it before? Well, because no one wanted you to see it. No one wanted you to see it. So... Now, I'm going to come back and I'm going to focus on someone from the Old Testament. But right now, I want to go to the New Testament. And I want you to look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. And has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and bounds of their habitation. So why is this important then? Why is this important for us to hear that? Well, it's important because for a long time we have not heard it. For a long time we have not had inclusivity. And someone asked me one time, he said, Pastor, there's no racism in church life, is it? So, well, Sunday's one of the most segregated times in the world. And unfortunately, we have black churches and we have white churches. And I say unfortunately because God didn't intend it to be that way. 
I don't believe he intended it. Uh, why do I say that? Because this is my belief. I believe that when I go to heaven, I'm not going to be directed to the black section. So then if, if I, I, I don't believe that for heaven, and so I believe it shouldn't be that way here on earth. Amen. But this, this scripture says that God has made of one blood all nations. All nations. So why would one nation want to hold or one race of people want to hold another race of people down and try to make you think that you're inferior? Hmm. But if you go to the Bible, you will find out that we're not inferior. Because the Bible talks about Nimrod. The Bible talks that he grew up and he became a mighty hunter. But not only that, but he grew mighty. He grew mighty. Now I'm going to go and we're going to talk about Jethro. We're going to go and talk about Jethro. Old Testament. That name I gave you earlier, um, Ketra, <coughs> in the book of Genesis. If you get some time, go back and follow through, read about her, and you'll find out and you'll see uh, that her bloodline is included here. Sometimes when you get to the begats, take your time and read them. You know, I, I remember I started reading it at one time it would say, and so-and-so begot, so-and-so, and so-and-so begot, so-and-so. And then it would say, and so-and-so married this woman. And I would say, well, okay, why is this woman's name here in this place where everybody else is the man? I would go back and I could check and I'd look it up and I'd realize that this person came from another tribe or came from another person. And the moment that is done, there's inclusivity of that group of people. God didn't leave anybody out. No one's left out. So I believe, and I'll make, I'll make this statement, I believe that if you're going to have a picture of the Last Supper, paint it right. <laughs> I'm just saying, paint it right. <laughs> okay, let me get back here. I want to stay on this. So I want to talk about Jethro and why this is important about Jethro. We've got to understand Jethro. I'm going to read a little bit so you can see where Jethro came from. But what's important about Jethro was that how many of you agree that Moses was a mighty man? He had a lot of people under him. But isn't it interesting that God appointed Jethro to give him godly advice? Find out the nationality of Jethro. Hmm, be surprised. Jethro, Genesis 25, verse 2. Now Moses kept flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Now, I want to go back for a moment to this lady that, was, that Abraham took as a wife. Her name was Ketra. And she bare him Zimram and Jokshan and Midian and Midian. Now, let's go back up here to Moses. In, 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 uh, um, in that, I'm sorry, it should be in Exodus 3.1. It says, And Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Jethro was a priest of Midian. And Midian was a son of Ketro. Now what you're seeing here is the black connection. And Midian is one of Ketra's children, meaning a grandson of Abraham. This is why generational stuff is important. Exodus 2 and verse 21, Moses was content to dwell with the man Jethro, and he gave Mo Moses Sipporah, his daughter. Mm. And he gave Moses Sipporah, his daughter. Now, Numbers 12 and verse 1. Obviously, I'm, I'm talking right now just some people in the, in, in, in the Old Testament. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman. Do you see that? Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he married. 
for he had married an Ethiopian woman. But Aaron and Moses spoke up against it. I remember when I was reading this the first time, for me, I was like, I, I, I think I found the first instance of racism in the Bible. Again, where's Ethiopia? And there could be many different shades of Ethiopian people, but naturally they are black. So Moses married an Ethiopian woman. She could have been dark shade, light shade, caramel shade, but she had some shade. And the Bible says that Miriam and Aaron spoke. Let me go over to Numbers 12. Let's go over to Numbers 12. Are you still awake? I know sometimes when we're, when we're teaching like this, it, it could put you to sleep. Maybe we'll just make sure you have some uh, uh, triple shot espresso coffee before you come in the morning. See, and this is the stuff that seems to be boring when you're reading through the Bible because you're going through genealogy. You're going through bloodline. Now, now listen. Uh, when you get into the, oh, man, okay. Okay, let me go here because I won't get to the spies too. You know the spies that were sent out? Yep. Uh, you got to trace them boys' history and find out what kind of shade they had. Because them boys were shaded too. But you don't know these things when you read it. You got to understand the, ge the generations and see how God has, has people involved. Okay, Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? See, because they won't question why God allow him to do that. If we had something to say about it, we would tell him not to marry her. And the Lord heard it. Now the man, Moses, was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses. Now notice here, it said he spoke suddenly. Ah, uh, anybody hear that? He spoke suddenly. He is showing me his attitude towards racism. So I don't think God is idly sitting by. And don't think he approves of racial discrimination. Because he does not. So if this be the case, can I burst another bubble? Some people may not like this then. How many do you think God has approved of slavery? And then how many would you think he would approve of, of during the time of slavery in, in America that he would approve of men who may have been preachers but yet going back and having slaves? I don't believe God would approve. I'm just throwing that out there to cause you to think. Many churches have grown and built out of the, this, this, this mindset that I believe God has no part in. Verse 4, And the Lord spoke suddenly unto Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. Come out. Come out, he says. I'm going to get this right. When the Lord spoke suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Marion, <clears throat> come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. You, you know what that means? Come out. I'm going to deal with you in front of everybody. This is, what, this is how you create people who I created as well. Come out, I'm going to deal with you right now. But he didn't just deal with them on the side in relations to this matter. Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. 
and they three came out, and the Lord came down in the pillar of a cloud. Mm. Have you know if you're a parent and your child acting up, and you say, "Don't make me come down there." <laughs> when you know when when mom and dad come down, something going gonna happen. On account of this situation, it says the Lord came down. What do you think now? God felt about that. And said, the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth and he said, hear my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, And he departed, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was. Anybody see that? What happened to Miriam? What, What happened to Miriam? And she became what? So if she became white as snow then that means she had to be something else. Am I right? So it says she became as white as snow. (laughs) I I can't, I I want to go somewhere. I'm not going to go there, but I want to go there so bad. So it says, because of leprosy, she became white as snow. So then leprosy was an impurity, which means whatever she was before was pure. Does that make sense? And I'm doing all this to show that we have value. Don't be left out of anything. If you're at school studying, you have value. If you're the only black kid in that class, that class is blessed today because they have you in that class. Understand that I was here. God created me with a purpose. Young man, how old are you? You're nine years of age. You need to understand and know right now that God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and it was put in place even before you were born. It was put in place way back when God created the universe that he had a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for your grandparents, for your mom's life. That's God's plan because he's generational. He generationally put me in the Bible. I'm all over this book. I'm not just here because one day I filled out an application. I'm here because when he took that soil and created Adam, he also put something in there that reflected me. Never again will I be left out of anything because my DNA from heaven has me included. Okay, I got to read this last part again here. And it said, and Mary became leprous. How many believe that leprous, well, lepro, leprosy is a disease because in the New Testament, Jesus was healing people of leprosy. So if Jesus had to le- heal someone of leprosy, then leprosy can't be something that is, it came from God. It has to come by way of sin. So if that's the case, then the, it says here that she became white as snow. My question is, what was she before? Making you think? See, there's some things that, People don't tell you. And when you read between the lines, they don't want you to know it all. They want you to know that you're a queen. They don't want you to know that you're a queen. They don't want you to know that you come from a a bloodline of royalty. 
And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. You see, this is God's reaction to people uh, uh, judging an, somebody and acting differently towards them because of the color of their skin. In other words, God's saying, I'm not having any of this. Now, if I was there, if I was there and I was hanging around Mary and, 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 and Aaron and I saw that, I would already get the message that I'm not going to act like that ever. I don't want my children to act like, you know why? Because this stuff can be generational. If you don't get cured from it, you could pass it on. <laughs> and verse 12 says, let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said to Moses, If her, fa if her father had spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received. But do you understand? God showed a statement here. Now, for me, a person of color, God showed that to him I had some value because he stood up. He stood up for, for, for someone like me. Now, Moses said, Moses said, Father, um, she said, uh, da, 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 da. And the Lord said unto Moses, no, let me go back here because Moses asked the Lord to heal. Yes, yes, yes. Verse 13. And Moses cried unto the Lord saying, heal her now, God. I beseech thee. Now, remember, God said, Moses is the man that I talk to mouth to mouth. Face to face, mouth to mouth. That means he had that relationship to get things from God right away. Right now, God knew that. He said that. But yet. He asked God to heal her, but God's stance on this racial attitude was so strong that God said if her father would spit in her face, in other words, shame on her. Not only that, Moses wanted God to heal her, but God said leave her outside for seven days. That's a tough statement. In other words, God said, I don't need this in my houses. I don't need this from my children. Just because someone has a different skin color, a different skin complexion, doesn't mean they have less value. God put value in you the day he created you. And somebody said, we still bleed red. And that is so true. Because I was reading with you earlier that from one blood, all nations were created. Oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm just getting warm. So let me go back to Jethro for a minute. When God needed someone to take Moses through a 40-year journey to give him leadership and guidance and to show him how to be a deliverer, he chose Jethro of the land of Midian. Of the land of Midian. You know what that means? He was a man of color. Of the land of Midian. Genesis 18 and verse 19 tells you that. I was giving you some scripture references so you can go back and confirm it and look it up. What was he? Well, Jethro's priesthood preceded that of Aaron. He took offerings and sacrifices. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses, his father-in-law. So this was a man who had, uh, what's the word? He, he had some pull. He, he was a man that had position. And here's the one, 
here's something else that I, I I'm just going to throw some things out to you to help us understand more and see that we were all included. God didn't leave us out. So when you're somewhere and you see pictures, you see paintings, and as I said before, if you're going to paint the picture of the Last Supper, let's, let's make it true. God didn't leave us out. People want to leave us out. But we have a role to play right now. The two spies, Caleb, the son of Juneth, uh, Jephthah. My man, those are some hard people. Please don't name your children. Don't give them these names. Uh, Caleb was the son of Jethanu, the Kenetzite, and that is a black man. I never knew that till I started digging before. I always heard about Caleb. You know, the one that came back was a spy that came back and gave a good report. But I didn't know that he was a person of color. Now, I'm going to move on to New Testament. Are you still awake? Yeah. Earlier when I started, I said I was going to give you some from the Genesis to Book of Revelation so that we could understand and see that we have a purpose, we have a role. This is 2021, and with all the injustices that we see happening around the, around the world, it's easy to want to question and to think, and, and, and please know this, that unfortunately for a lot, of, a lot of people today, the image that they have of black people is the image or their opinion is, is, is molded by what they see on media and what they see in social media. And one of the worst things that I really don't like is when I, if I ever hear music, rap music, and someone... And, and there's a, a, a black a rapper, and we're using the N word to 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 associate with each other. That's not who we are. And the more we do that, we devalue us, and then other people see that. Well, if you can use it in a song, then I can use it in a song. How do you feel? This happened to me one day, driving along, come to a red light, this car pulls up, this kid is in it, there's a young white kid in it, and they were listening to rap music, and the N-word was in it. And they were playing and singing a song, and, and they looked over and they saw me, they turned it down. But if I was not there, then you'd sing it. See, my problem with that is that we put it out there. I don't see young brothers that way. And when someone comes up and says, hey, what's up, my end? Nah, don't. Here's what I like. If I see a brother say, hey, what's up? What's up, king? Rule with me as a king. What's up, king? What's up, royalty? See, because we've got to change the mindset. And it's going to start on how I see me. How I portray me to this young man, you know what? Is eventually how this young man is going to also see himself. If I portray a picture to this young man, the best way to live is to go out and do all this other stuff and get all this fancy stuff from what you're doing. Then that young man's going to say, well, if you did it, I'm going to do it. So at what point does that stop? Because if I could do that and paint that picture, then I could paint a picture of getting an education. I could get a picture and show him it's good to be a lawyer, to be a doctor, to be a pastor, to be a preacher, to be an apostle, to be a prophet, to be an astrophysicist. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, okay, of, uh, of African heritage in, in, in the Bible. We talked about some in the Old Testament now in the New Testament, let's go over to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And 
And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And I'm going to come back. I'll read it first. Verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galatians? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia. Circle that word. Mesopotamia. And in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamelia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya, 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 yeah. about Cyrene, the stranger and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Mesopotamia is a part of the continent of Africa. So, you see, we're, we were involved even on the day of Pentecost. God didn't leave us out. You, we, our representation was there. I have a right, a covenant right. And I understand and know that I am included. Acts chapter 13, please. Acts 13, verses 1 to 3. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers and Barnabas and Simeon, the one called Niger and Lucius of Syrian and Manian, which had been brought up by brought up with her Herod, the Tetriot and Saul. Niger, that word Niger was a word, a Latin word used to describe blackness. He was he was there. The, a representation of us was there. So at the time of the outpouring, we weren't left out. It was intended for us to have it, too. And the, the word here is inclusivity. Can I give you just a couple more? And uh, I'll, I'll just give you I'll, I'll give you and I'll just give you the um, scripture references. Um. In, in Matthew chapter 1, 1 to 14, I'm not going to read it all, the genealogy of Jesus in which four Afro-Asiatic women are included, Rahab, Tamar, Ruth, and Bathsheba. In the bloodline of Jesus. Come on. Now, if that don't boost your, your stock way up, <laughs> I don't know what will. <laughs> you know, no matter what people thought of me in the past, my stock just went way up. I hope this is blessing somebody. See, we read about Bathsheba, but we never go back and find out who she really was or where she came from. We read about Rahab, but we, we, all we heard about Rahab is that she was a harlot, but we don't go back and read where she came from. We read about Tamar and Ruth, but we, we, we don't take the time to go back and find their lineage and see where they came from. But see, what this shows is that you are represented. What this shows is that we were not a second thought to God. We weren't an afterthought. It, it, God didn't go like, oh, I got black people. Hmm, what do I do with them? No. We were, we were in this all together. But here's the important thing. Here's the important thing. Now that we know this information, here's the important thing is don't focus on it. It's good for you to know, but what you need to focus on is the one who you cannot see. Who you come from that has no color or no form. Amen. And don't walk by your head. Be led by the spirit. Amen. See, because if I'm led by the spirit, I'm not led by what I see physically. And if I intend to jump and dance around in heaven, I better get used to jumping and dancing around here in the local church with white people, with, with native people, with yellow skinned people. Because when I get to heaven, it's all going to be there. Amen. And this is where I practice now. 
This is how you practice your worship for heaven. You want to sing in a choir, you won't get to heaven to sing in a choir, but can't stand next to a black person and sing in a choir with them here on earth? You want to sit right up front in heaven, but can't sit up front next to a person of color right now? So understand this, that we were not left out. And for too long, we've had to deal with attitudes against us because of lies about us. But if God saw value that we were included. Now look at this. At Pentecost, we were there. In the bloodline of Jesus, we were there. Guess what? At the very beginning, we were there. So at those important moments, we were included. Do you know what that means? That means we're included right now. Right now. All right, let me move on. Matthew 27, 32. You don't have to turn there. Simon of Serene, compelled to carry the cross, black man, while everybody else stood around and watched, black man. I remember when I was young and I remember watching a movie, and in the movie they, you know, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me in the old crucifixion movies, and then all of a sudden there's always this one scene where this black man would come out and carry the cross. It wasn't until I got older and wonder, whoa. Yeah, we, somebody said it. I was going to say, where'd he come from? How'd he get in the movie? But guess what? That was because I was just checking the movie. But if I read the book and I could realize, you got to understand when people say a name of a certain place, go look at where that place come from. And you'll see the culture involved. Here's the other thing about when you read in scripture and you keep it in context, you can see and understand the culture of the day. And understand how things flow culturally. You know, so really when I look at this and you go back and you think about Nimrod who built the Tower of Babel. You, you remember that? When you think about that and you go back and you look and you see the bloodline, you see Jethro being a man of color who gave guidance to, to, a, to, to Moses and, and all of his people. When you think, then the, you know what that says? That, says? that doesn't paint a picture of a people who, doesn't, who don't have any value. That paints a picture of people who were important. Because Jethro had an opportunity to speak to the man Moses. The same man who God pulled Miriam and, a and Aaron outside the same man who they came up against, this is the same man that God selected Jethro to give godly counsel to. So then that means then we got value. That, that means we, we, we have an important role to play from the beginning to the middle. Even when our Savior was carrying his cross, we were not left out. Why? Because while everybody else stood around and watched, a man of color stepped in and said, I will carry this. So we have a role to play at every level in this book. Don't let anybody ever tell you you're not in here. Don't let anybody ever say that you were cursed of God because you weren't. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 1. You don't have to turn there. Two of the four prophets... And teachers at Antioch were uh, were African. Think about that. Two of the four teachers and prophets in Acts chapter thirteen, verse one. Of the two of the four prophets and teachers were Africans. I'll give you some names. Lucius of Cyrene. So obviously, Simon of Cyrene. So then that means Lucius of Cyrene come from the same place. And Simeon was called Niger. Again, it's a Latin term for the black man. Somebody say, I'm included. Acts 18, 24 and 25 tells of Apollos, who was the Jew of Alexandria in North Africa, becomes converted. 
See, every step of the way, God had us in mind. How many of you remember the story of the Ethiopian eunuch? God sent Philip. But check it out. God sent Philip. Acts 8, 26, 39. God sent Philip to share the gospel with this African man so he could take the message and transform his country. You see, God has used us in every move. Every move, God has used us. And today, if we pay attention, he's using us still. And I want you to know this, that at no time has God ever left us out. Amen. This being African Heritage Month, you know what I realize? I'm all in this. I'm all in this. From the beginning to the, to the end, yes. I'm all in this. He, and you know what? He didn't forget me in any book. So when you read through the Bible, understand the culture and understand the geography and understand where people come from and how people are connected. And what you'll see is evidence, again, tracing black to, 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 to our African heritage is included in the Bible. So be proud of who you are. Be proud of knowing that God's got a plan. He's always had a plan. His plan from the very beginning, it included us. Why is this important? Because for so long, we've been left out of everything. Come on. For so long, we've been left out. And listen, there's so many things that come from this and go deep. How many of you know that for many people today, even in around the world, sometimes um, hmm, I'm going to stop there. I have something heavy on my heart I want to say, but the Holy Spirit is not releasing me yet. So what I want to encourage you to do today is walk right. I want you to encourage, walk, hold your head up. I want you to understand that you come from a line of royalty. But here it is, all of us. See, the problem that we have today is that the picture that has been painted is that it wasn't all of us. It was all of them. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is that it's all of us. Everybody, one blood. One blood, one blood. And I like it, somebody said earlier here, they said that we all bleed red. So, be proud of who you are in Christ. Understand and recognize your ethnicity. Recognize and realize that God included you in this. And I'm going to burst the bubble. I said it before. I'm going to burst it again. I don't believe that there's a black church or a white church or an Asian church. I believe when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for his church, for his church. And we must learn to worship with each other. Amen. Amen. I hope this was a blessing to you today. And uh, I, 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 I hope it shed some light for us all to understand that God has always had a plan for us. Always had a plan. And everybody is included. He did not create junk on the day of creation when he created man. He did not. Amen? Amen. All right, listen. I want you to know that God loves you and I love you. And if you're here today and you have your tithe and your offering, I'm going to pray over your tithe and your offering. As a matter of fact, and as you leave... We have our offering bucket back there. I want to commend you for coming out and thank you for coming in. And for those who have pledged to, to help with the equipment, we want to say continue to honor your pledge and thank you so much. Uh, it's really helping us get the work done. For the Yes, and because of your help, we now have two cameras running and uh, the sound system and everything is coming good. We've got a wonderful team back there. So we're, we're very excited. But this is part of the work. <laughs> Come on up. Pastor Brown, I'm going to get you to bless the offering anyway while you're there. Praise the Lord. I think it's really important to mention the man you guys see back there in the booth. 
Terry. His name is Terry. Yes. He's been nothing but help in his passion and his fire that he has to help. You know, it's really good. I think we should stand and give him a clap, you yeah. know, and tell him how much we appreciate him. Let, well, let me, let me tell you something funny. It, we may not have seen this, but I remember, I think it was the first time Terry came. Uh, it was kind of on short notice, and uh, Kiana in the back did, didn't know he was coming, so she was up here practicing. And Kiana looks at me, and she goes, who's that guy messing with my camera? <laughs> you know, and here he is today. Terry, we love you, man. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you so much for your insight and, and, and helping us understand what we need to do to do this. I'm going to get you to bless the offering. <coughs> all right. Let us remain standing. All right. Let us bow our heads. Thank you, Lord Heavenly Father, for bringing us all here today. Thank you for your tender mercy and grace upon our lives and the lives of our loved ones, near and far, those saved and unsaved. Today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the offering. Let it be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth, Father God. Bless those who gave and bless those who couldn't give. And make way, Father God, for those who couldn't give that they may be able to give, Father God. In Jesus' name we do pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. I want to remind everybody about the pastor, elder, and leadership meeting tonight at 7 o'clock here at the church. God bless you. God loves you. And I do too. Awesome.